what I'd like to do this morning is just look very briefly at the very last petition of the Lord's Prayer. Que mis ines y mas esperas mon, araris y mas apo tu poniru. And that's normally translated as, lead us not into temptation, uh, but deliver us from evil. Now, you may have heard that a couple of years ago, in 2018, 2017 maybe, Pope Francis made a change in the translation of this final petition for the Roman Catholic Church in Italy. Instead of saying, lead us not into temptation, it now says in Italian, do not let us fall into temptation. Now, in an interview on Italian television, he said that it's not a good translation from the original Greek that the Gospel of Matthew was written in. He says it's not a good translation because it speaks of a God who induces temptation, he told Italian broadcasters. I am the one who falls. It's not God pushing me into temptation and then to see how I have fallen. A real father, a loving father, doesn't do that. A father helps you to get up immediately. It's Satan, he says, who leads us into temptation. That's his department. Now, there is a certain truth to what Pope Francis is saying. This petition, as it's currently translated not only into Italian, but also into Elizabethan English, could be wrongly taken to imply that God himself tempts us. Nothing could be further from the truth. On this, the scriptures are absolutely clear. In the letter of James, James says, no one would tempted no one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he tempts no one. Rather, one is tempted by his own desire. So the very first thing that we have to admit in regard to this petition is that we are tempted by our own desires, desires that have gone awry. Our egotistical arrogance, our hatred for other people, our cruelty, our greed, anger, and all the other vices that pull us away from God's loving presence and forcing us to sink back into ourselves and making us children of evil instead of children of God, the God who is love. Now, that word temptation in English implies deception, trickery, enticement, even entrapment. And that is indeed the work of Satan and not the work of God. On this understanding, do not let us fall into temptation is a petition in which we ask God for discernment to be able to see clearly those things that deceive us and entice us. Things that may look good or even feel good, but in reality are evil and destructive. We're asking to be cleansed to be purified from our tendency towards sin and death, from all our harmful inclinations towards evil. Now, part of the confusion around all of this is that the Greek word pirasmos, which is found all over the scriptures and translated in several different ways, does not simply mean temptation in the sense of deception and enticement. It also has connotations of trial, of testing, the idea of being proven that getting through such testing and coming out the other side can even strengthen our faith and bring it more sharply into focus. So for example, in the letter of James that I just quoted, just a verse or two before what I said, it also says, blessed is the man who endures pirasmon, trials or temptations, because when he is proven, he will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now that crown of life, James says, the scriptures also, by the way, speak of the crown of righteousness, the crown of living rightly. That crown will be bestowed by God on all of us who live faithfully unto the end, just like the crown of victory was bestowed upon ancient athletes in the Olympic Games, where they gave not medals as we do today, but crowns, crowns made of laurel leaves. And perhaps now you can begin to understand why we use crowns in the Orthodox wedding service. Now, pirasmos can also refer to a crisis. 
In fact, crisis is also a Greek word coming from krisis, meaning a judgment, a moment of judgment that shows us what we're really made out of, a moment that tests us, that pushes us to the limit, that tests our integrity and our faithfulness, a crisis in which we may fail the test and actually fall away from God. That's why the Lord Jesus will tell Peter and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, keep alert and pray so that you do not enter into pirasmos, temptation or testing. How do you view your life? That's a really important question. What's the guiding metaphor that you use to understand your life? It's important because how you see your life will shape how you actually live. People say a lot of different things about how they view life these days. Some people say life is a circus. Others say it's a game. Some people say it's a party. One person even said to me it's a minefield. Other people will say it's a roller coaster, a journey. And some people will say that it's like a carousel ride. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, but most of the time you just go round and round. Now, if you see your life as a game, Winning is going to be the most important thing to you. And you know the old bumper sticker, those who die with the most toys wins. That's actually pretty stupid. Uh, don't pay attention to those kinds of bumper stickers because when you die, it doesn't matter how many toys you have, you're still dead and you don't take any of your toys with you. As someone once said, there are no U-Hauls behind hearses. We take nothing with us. Now, if you say that your life is a party, your main goal in life will be just simply partying, to have fun, whatever that means to you. And most people who live that way, by the time they reach a certain age, and not even a necessarily a very old age, they'll tell you it's just empty. It's just empty. Now one of the ways that we as Christians see life is that it's a test. Words like temptation and trials and testing are found not only in the Lord's Prayer, but all over the scriptures and in the lives and writings of the saints. So those texts will vary, I'm sorry, forgive me, character is developed and revealed by the tests we face in life. Those tests will vary from person to person, but some things are common to us all. There will be in our lives major disappointments, illnesses, senseless tragedies, loneliness. We are always facing such tests in life, actually even in the very littlest of things. Do we open the door for other people? Do we always treat people with respect and compassion? Do we even just pick up a piece of trash off the ground that other people haven't noticed? All of life in that sense is a test and nothing is insignificant. Every day is an opportunity for us to trust in God, grow towards Christ in love, and deepen our character and our integrity as people. So when we pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, we're not asking to be spared all the difficulties and pain that life itself sends our way. Living in a fallen world as we do, we are prisoners of sin and death, those things will inevitably come our way. Even the greatest of saints never had easy lives. In fact, most often just the opposite. Their lives were often exceptionally difficult and painful, often ending in martyrdom because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So here, what we're asking for is that God will give us the faith, the hope, the courage and the strength to face whatever testing comes our way in life so that we continue on our pilgrimage of faith and repentance. May God grant us that we not fail the test of life. Now, the next part of that, Adarisimas apotuponiru, deliver us from evil. That last petition turns us to the realities of evil. These words remind us that the pray the Lord's Prayer puts us in the midst of a cosmic struggle. There can be no ignoring of the battle between good and evil that constantly rages all around us and even within us. Evil is large 
cosmic, organized, subtle, pervasive, and real. And what's worse is that evil so often masquerades as something good. Things are not right in this world. Already in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, God tells Cain before he murders his brother Abel, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you have to master it. Now that's not even news, although in case you haven't noticed, news headlines always emphasize what's wrong and not what's right, whatever is evil and not what's good. If it bleeds, it leads is the old saying. So the headlines are about murder, violence, and war, every kind of betrayal and bloodshed. And then we wonder why we are so depressed and angry <laughs> and antagonistic towards one another, especially now here in November. Deliver us from evil so that in the face of evil, suffering, and temptation, our faith will not waver, our sense of hope will not weaken, our love will not dry up, and the darkness of evil will not enter and rule our hearts, leading us to do what's evil. Now you have to understand, evil is not an abstraction. It always has a personal side. So for example, there exists no concrete reality, no substance that we can call hatred. I can't hold up an object and say this is hatred. Hatred exists in the person who hates. And this is expressed concretely in his actions. Everything in this world, everything in this life is personal. So it's not simply from evil as some kind of impersonal intellectual abstraction that we're praying for deliverance from. We're praying here for deliverance from the evil one, the evil person in whom evil has taken root and who lives by evil instead of good, by hatred instead of love, by lies instead of truth. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian Orthodox writer who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, wrote about his experience in the forced labor camps of Russia under communism. And he said that the cruelties he experienced in the camps there gave him stark insights into the realities of good and evil. This is what he says. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. But because evil is also cosmic in nature, not merely human, because our battle is also against demonic forces, the principalities and the powers, as St. Paul calls them, the Lord's Prayer is also making a reference here to Satan, who in the scriptures is called the adversary the enemy of the human race. The Lord Jesus, the apostles, and all the saints will speak of Satan as the personal face of this cosmic evil. Luke's gospel tells us that Satan enters into Judas, leading him to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The Lord Jesus himself will speak of Satan sifting the apostle Peter as thoroughly as wheat is sifted by overwhelming him with a temptation to despair after his denial of Christ. Later in his first letter, Peter referred to Satan prowling about like a hungry lion, seeking someone to devour. And the book of Revelation describes Satan as the one who deceives the whole world, making war against the saints through persecution. Now, it's not very popular these days for me to say to you that we as Christians believe that Satan is real. And yet when we look around us and face the world at any real depth and for any real length of time, it soon becomes clear that there is more to evil in this world than what is even contained within the human heart. That there is a power outside us against which we must also struggle in order to remain faithful to God. Our warfare, and let's call it by what it really is, is on two fronts. One is internal to us, contained within our hearts, and all the selfishness, arrogance, and hatred that can be found there. And one front is external to us, although the battlefield on which this external war is fought nevertheless remains 
our hearts. Whenever we do the service for the making of a catechumen, whenever someone is entering the life of the church through baptism or chrismation, there are a series of questions that are asked, and the first one is always, do you renounce Satan and all of his works and all of his worship and all of his angels and all of his pomp? And the correct answer is always, I do renounce him. And from that moment, the struggle begins between good and evil within us and continues until the day we die. C.S. Lewis was a British Christian writer. He was a professor at Oxford. He once wrote that there are two equal and opposite errors which the human race can fall into about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe in their existence and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The devils themselves are equally pleased by both errors. So in this final petition of the Lord's Prayer, we confront our temptations, we face our trials, and we ask for the faith, courage, and strength to get through them, to be delivered from all evil, both the evil that's already in our hearts, it causes so much pain and suffering to those around us and to ourselves, and the evil that comes from the evil one, our only real enemy, who is Satan. So in teaching us to pray, and to pray very specifically the Lord's Prayer, the Lord Jesus is making us more truthful and more faithful. This is a prayer for someone totally committed to Christ, someone who truly wants to be his disciple, someone who wants to know God as a loving father, who wants to forgive and be forgiven, who wants to be transformed, who wants to honor God's name by everything we say and in everything that we do and live in such a way that his kingdom can be made known to everyone through us, through us. It's a prayer that challenges us in almost every way. How can I pray our Father? How can I pray our if I live only for myself? How can I pray Father if I don't act as if I am truly God's child? How can I pray hallowed be thy name if I don't have a deep desire to be holy myself, a desire to become a saint? How can I pray thy will be done if I live only according to my own will and never seek what his will is? How can I ask God to forgive me when I so often refuse to forgive others? How can I pray, give us this day our daily bread, if I refuse to give bread or the basic necessities of life to those who are hungry and have nothing? Please make no mistake about this. If you understand what the Lord's Prayer really says, you understand that it is the prayer for all of us who truly want to be Christians, who truly want to be disciples of the Lord Jesus. God bless you all. Good morning. Oops. Hi, honey.